Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we are returning to War in the Pacific Admiral's Edition, our Let's Play series against XTRG. We're moving into late February, it is February 27th of 1942, so the month is almost over. Uh, the last episode was a pretty eventful one. We had a surface action near Tulagi. Unfortunately, we lost a light cruiser of ours, but our intelligence reports are saying that we sank a Japanese destroyer in response, uh, and frankly, given the Japanese number of destroyers versus the allied number of light cruisers, I think that's a fair trade. We also shot up a couple of other vessels as well, um, a couple of other destroyers. And, uh, and we, you know, we've, we basically put XTRG on notice that he's got to be careful with his supply lines. You can see there we had a submarine, a Dutch sub, fire some torpedoes at a Japanese light cruiser off Ambon uh, to no effect. Uh, the I-7, a Japanese submarine here, just launched some torpedoes off at the Louisville, which is trying to escape from Port Moresby. She was under air bombardment last turn. Now she's trying to get away from Japanese submarines. Six torpedoes fired, no hits. So that's a very good result for us. Uh, it's always nerve-wracking when you see one of your big warships in the uh, in the in the sights of enemy enemy warships. Meanwhile, Japanese light cruiser here is cl closing with the Dutch patrol craft, the Zeman. I can't imagine that she will put up much of a fight, but the Zeman does uh, does is carrying supply. So you can see here a couple of uh, two hits now on the Zeman, and she instantly sinks. Woof. All right, well, the Zeman, which is responsible for bringing more than 15,000 supply into Bataan, was in the process of unloading supplies in Mindanao. My hope is that she got some of her supplies off so that the forces in Kayagun are not out of supply and that they can fight another effective battle. Uh, they were completely out of supply. The Zeman had docked last turn and she was working on unloading it. So I'm hoping that maybe we got three or 400 of the supply off. And, uh, and and would help there. Meanwhile, the I-7 has found another target. In this case, it's a troop transport. Fortunately for us, the troop transport has already uh, dropped her soldiers, but she's still worth a fair number of uh, victory points here. So uh, we obviously don't want her to get sunk. Meanwhile, the Stuart is firing back in retribution, dropping some jet charges on the I-7 uh, and uh, being pretty persistent there. So a couple of near misses here, rattling the sub, probably doing a little bit of system damage, although I'm not sure if there's anything uh, that substantial. Yeah, the Zeman was already at like 20, 30 system damage. She was, uh, that was due to my own, my own issues. Meanwhile, the Michal, the troop transport took a, tr took a torpedo, heavy damage, and she sinks. Fuck. All right, so she did sink. I think that's probably 12 to 15 victory points to the Japanese, uh, but, uh, she got her battalion into Port Moresby, which is the important thing. Um, uh, Sedgehammer, thanks for the follow, by the way. All right, so a lot of recon going on here. Pretty eventful night phase there, a, a, a surface engagement off Mindanao, and then the uh, I-6 or I-7, whatever it was, firing a total of 12 torpedoes uh, at, our, at our shipping. I guess that's good. Maybe they'll use the torpedoes up and force it to return to base, maybe lessen the pressure outside of Moresby a bit. I'm not sure what we can really do. Moresby has enough supply to hang out for a little while, but I think the Japanese force is too strong that if he really presses it, if he gets the supply in... Port Moresby is going to fall. Um, when did the social connotation of F come from? Uh, it came from a Call of Duty video game, uh, uh, first-person shooter. It was like two or three years ago, whichever Call of Duty that was, where uh, basically one of your comrades dies and one of the cutscenes has you at, at their funeral. And you walk up to the casket and the game just ridiculously tells you to press F uh, to pay respects to the soldier uh, who, of yours who had died. It's just so such a terrible mechanic, like, oh, you need to press this button to pay respects. It was pretty stupid, but um, that's kind of where it came from. All right, so we've got 24 Japanese Zeros sweeping over Sorabaya. We had six fighters in combat air patrol. These guys are fucked. Uh, five 75A Hawks and one B339D. The B339D is the Dutch Buffalo. The Hawk is actually a pretty decent aircraft in my opinion, but we don't have very many of them. I mean, frankly, with the amount of aircraft that he's been sweeping, he's been showing more than 30 Oscars and more than 20 zeros over Sorabaya. We just don't have the resources there to put up much of a resistance, but I'm gonna continue throwing aircraft up as long as I can because the guys are goners anyway. And as much as I sort of delay his 
uncontested uh, bombing of, of the, the Java, the island of Java, I think the better. It wasn't advanced warfare, it was the one after that. At least I don't think it was advanced warfare. Um, all right, so we lost one buffalo and one hawk. It could have definitely been worse. Is that was Advanced Warfare the one with um, was it Kevin Spacey in it? Six Nels bomb. They do a little bit of damage to some of our aircraft on the ground, but he's only he's only flying in with six of them. He's also bombing from twenty thousand feet. Interesting that they're dropping sixty kilogram bombs. These guys must be on uh, must be on extended range or something. That doesn't seem right. Don't they carry heavier payloads than that? Uh, X to doubt. That's uh, that's L.A. Noir, right? Although it wasn't quite worded in that way. I played a fair bit of Noir. I never beat it, but I, I put a, a good number of hours into it. It was a good game. I just wish it was a little bit more open worldy. I think it would have really shown if it was more in sort of the traditional Rockstar uh, open world game as opposed to being much more linear. All right, so we've got the, t the typical Japanese air attacks here going into Bataan, hitting our soldiers there. We're doing a fair bit of damage with Flak there. We just shot down a Lily with Flak. I keep forgetting we've got some of our Dutch aircraft. Uh, wait, so apparently he's got 16 A5 M4 cloths, which were on a training mission, and our uh, DO 24K1s, um, I guess, are being jumped by pilots that are training. So you can see here, no losses on either side. You can see this is the Hosho 1 with A5 M4. So it's the Hosho Air Group, which means that he's either transferred aircraft from the Hosho to Celebs, or more likely they're operating off a carrier in that area. So that does give us, uh, that does give us an indication that the mini Kidubutai is in the Dutch East Indies area, which would be great for our carriers in that direction if there weren't so many land-based bombers. Meanwhile, it is the Kitty Butai. We have detected, or Kiddo Butai, however you pronounce it. I'd like to say Kitty Butai or whatever. But um, you can see here some Val dive bombers are hitting the cane. We sent the cane down from Johnston Island because we detected two Japanese tankers here near uh, northeast of Baker Island. Instead, the cane becomes a sacrificial lamb to basically confirm to us 18 zeros, 9 Val dive bombers. That means there's a Japanese carrier in that area. Presumably, it's the fleet carriers. We've got a lot of recon going on in that area, but I think, guys, we may have spotted the main Japanese carrier force. And it is astride our supply line to Australia, so we're going to have to be very careful with that. More Vals, more Kates. B2 or Kates and Vals are all spotting the cane. And that is a lot of recon aircraft. So again, that pretty much confirms that this is the main body of the enemy fleet, the main body of the enemy carrier formation. There are just too many recon there by both dive bombers and torpedo bombers. Uh, there are multiple carriers there. There are no other ships directly around Kane. There are submarines, but no ships. It's okay, guys. That was the Kane's job to begin with. I hate to say it, but sometimes, as a fleet admiral, you've got to make sacrifices. The Kane's an old four stacker from World War I. She doesn't have a lot of value. She's not a good anti-submarine platform. She's not a good gun platform. She's not particularly long-ranged. I made a calculated decision to send it south. It's one they'll write home in the history books about how the crew was left to die by the U.S. Navy that did not come rescue their survivors. All right, so Japanese float plane fighters, uh, as well as some Zeros here flying cover over Lei. You can see one A-24 Banshee made it through. That's a Dauntless dive bomber. We lost one damaged, one destroyed. No damage to the AMC Bangkok Maru. Um, you can see here we dropped a 1,000-pound bomb. 
You can also see that these jakes here are float plane zero, basically. But then the Zu Suiho uh, is operating near Lei. So either, again, either he's transferred uh, fighters to the land from the Suiho, which probably would be operating out of Rabal, or he's got carriers in this area. So he seems to either have split up the mini Kiributai because we spotted some of her vessels over by the Dutch East Indies, or he split up the main Kitty Butai, uh, and he's kind of shuffled his carrier formations up a little bit. Um, in any event, um, it is indicating that he's either put put aircraft ashore, or the the naval vessels are operating in those regions. All right, 13 more Val dive bombers, 18 more zeros. So again, a second wing of Vals. Pretty much, again, that confirms it's at least a fleet carrier. The fact that we've seen 36 zeros all in the AM phase tells us that it's got at least two fleet carriers operating in this area. You can see 500 kilogram bombs are striking the cane. The cane is a goner. Oof, down she goes. Three bomb hits on the cane, 18 zeros, 13 vals. Magazine explodes on the cane. At least it was quick, boys. At least it was quick. So we've spotted indications of at least two Japanese fleet carriers in the Eastern Pacific or Central Pacific, and we've spotted indication of two Japanese light carriers in the Dutch East Indies and in and around the Bismarck Archipelago. So it's a pretty eventful turn already. We've lost one destroyer, we've lost one troop transport so far. So it has been... I wouldn't say a costly turn, but it's definitely not been an uneventful turn. And now we are into the land combat phase, and the Japanese are launching another deliberate attack at Singapore. As you remember, I was pretty pleased that we had nearly wrecked the Imperial Guards Division. You can see here their assault value is 79. It, it was originally over 400. The 18th has been bloodied as well at below 300. The 5th is in very good shape at over 400. Additionally, he has multiple engineer regiments here, infantry regiments, uh, and a wide number of supporting units as well. Why is the Kitty Butai out that way? Well, Mexicans, I'm not sure. He could be making a play for Palmyra, which would really mess with our supply routes to Australia. He could also be making a play for Christmas Island, or frankly, he may just be trying to raid our supply line. That is not an uncommon tactic for Japanese players. If you can get in amongst a big troop convoy, you can really rack up some victory points pretty damn quick. If you sink like 15, 12, you know, victory point ships right there, that's... That's, you know, that's a substan- that's basically almost a carrier, or at least a battleship, worth of victory points. It all depends, though, because he's got to have a lot of logistical support if he's operating that remotely. Like, he's got to have a lot of tankers and stuff. He's burning a lot of fuel to be out that way. Let's go ahead and fast forward through the Japanese deliberate attack, and let's pray that our boys hold out. I'm, I'm banking on Singapore holding for another week. That's my hope. You can see the 48th Division has lost a lot. The 21st Division, the 5th Division is down below 400. The 18th Division is down below 300. These are all still strong formations. Good result for us, actually. One to two combat odds. Fort level stays at three. They didn't reduce the fort level. That is great news for us. We did lose a unit destroyed, but the fact is we destroyed 181 Japanese combat infantry squads. That's 181 victory points right there. 31 enemy engineer squads destroyed, 81 disabled. We crippled, I think, we crippled his engineer formation there. That is 100 and, uh, what, 12 engineers disabled or killed. It doesn't tell me exactly what his engineer force is here, but that is a pretty devastating loss, I think, for him. Again, 181 combat squads, that's the equivalent of an entire brigade uh, wiped out. 296 of them are disabled, um, 56 non-combatants disabled, 31 engineers, 81 disabled, 50 guns, 2 destroyed, 48 disabled, uh, and some... Oh, crap, I hit the button before I looked at our own losses, but our losses were minimal. We did lose a unit, but I don't think we lost much in the way of actual, like, 
casualties. Meanwhile, our troops at Changtha pulled out. Remember, he had attacked there deliberately multiple turns in a row, uh, but our infantry got out of there. So he's going to take the base, but we are moving west toward, uh, toward this river line here and some rough terrain that will hopefully slow him down a bit. So they took the base. After many days of fighting, we evacuated. No, Sean, that... Well, I guess between permanent and temporary losses, he lost the equivalent of a division. Japanese deliberate attack at Wang Kao. So this is the Stalingrad on the coast. We put a minefield here a couple turns ago. He's going to launch an attack here. That one went better for him. He reduced the fortification level down to zero. I thought it already was zero. Uh, one to one assault odds, 280 Japanese casualties versus 1,107 allied casualties, 54 allied squads destroyed. Uh, so that's not a great result. Wen Kao is going to fall. The 100th Corps is continuing to do work, but at the end of the day, it can only hold on for so long. Wen Kao, if it doesn't fall next turn, it will probably fall in the next two or three days. Japanese deliberate attack at Henyan. Remember, we moved the 46th Corps in here behind his flank, hoping that he didn't have any any forces here, but he has a mixed brigade and an engineer regiment. They easily drive the 46 Corps back in 40 to one, 40 to one odds. They uh, force it to retreat, 13 guns destroyed, two engineers destroyed, 63 non-combatants, 50 squads destroyed. I'd rather the unit be destroyed because I'd get a third of the unit back for free reforming at Chongqing. Another Japanese deliberate attack, this one on the island of Mindanao here you can see Four SNLF forces, five SNLF forces, a naval guard unit, and a infantry regiment. The infantry regiment's already shot up a little bit. It's still in decent shape. It's at like 70% effectiveness there. Um, the SNLF forces are near full strength. You can see here our troops are pretty battered. We've got a couple of decent units, um, some battalions. The regiments are beat up a little bit, but the 102nd Filipino Army Infantry Division is in very good shape. This is where the Zeman was unloading supplies to try and keep these guys in the fight. We'll see how this one plays out. That looked really good for us. One to two assault odds. He doesn't reduce the fortification. Another good result for us on the island of Mindanao. We did lose 15 squads destroyed. So did he, but I will take a push every day of the week when it comes to victory points uh, on Mindanao. Um, so additionally, he also had 49 disabled versus our 33. He had 12 non-combatants disabled to our five. He had zero engineers. I don't even know if he had any engineers involved. 10 guns to our two. But that is a great result there for us. The Filipino Infantry Division's holding there. We didn't have any penalty for supply, so the Zeman must have gotten off a fair amount of her supply to keep those troops in good shape because they, they didn't get a supply penalty. Here's the other hope. He's going to see this, right? He's going to see the combat modifiers, and he's going to see that supply was not a penalty for the defenders, so that may make him hesitate to attack again. He may wait a couple days. He may wait a week. He really needs either reinforcements or to allow his troops to rest and recover a bit. So I'm really hoping that uh, that he sees this and he, he's a little bit more cautious because I doubt we have much supply from more than maybe one more attack. But hey, all the damage we can inflict, all the better. Japanese deliberate attack and Bander Jasmine. I don't think we're going to hold here. Uh, he's got multiple... Uh, he's got a guard unit, an SNLF unit. We just have an understrength uh, uh, battalion of, of Dutch troops here. And you can see there he pushed us back. So he pushed our troops back. He took Bander Jasmine, which is a level 3 airfield, guys. So with the fall of Bander Jasmine, he already has Air Force units here. You could see him in the attack. So that's going to pretty much close down the island of Java. As soon as he gets J3M uh, Nels in here or he gets some Bettys in here, it's curtains for Java. Although I don't think any of the units that we saw there are capable of putting torpedoes out. So that's the one positive is that they, it'll be primarily land-based bombers with, with bombs and not something that I think he'll be, he'll be using torpedoes off of. At least not until he brings a, a headquarter Air Force unit down. Um, okay, so we've got 52 Japanese casualties there versus 466 allied Allied bombardment attack at Kuching. Boy, you guys are brave. The Punjab Battalion there might help us hold out there for a little bit. It's a very active turn in terms of ground combat. 
Allied shock attack at Chiki Kang. Remember, we brought a large number of our troops and corps across. You can see here the 4th in Independent Mixed Regiment here of the Japanese is massively outnumbered. Let's hope our Chinese troops shock attacking across the river can overwhelm these Japanese troops. I don't think they have anywhere to retreat. The only roadways are to the east where we have troops or to the west where we have troops. So I'm hoping we can destroy this entire regiment. Sometimes Japanese units can be incredibly... Uh, stubborn, however, where they're like outnumbered 10 to 1 odds and they continue fighting. So we'll have to hope that we just have so many troops that we overwhelm them. You can see here their assault value is down to zero. We haven't even finished all of our units attacking it. Let's fast forward and see what happens. We captured the base. They had an adjusted defensive 1 versus 2,855. Wow! Look at those assault odds. Plus for defender gets plus for train leaders, minus for preparation. We get plus for shock. We wiped him out, boys. The 4th Japanese Regiment is a goner. 75 squads destroyed, 18 non-combatants, 14 engineers, and 46 guns that the Japanese will have to replace. That is a good result. Chinese Army wiped him out, clears our supply line east to our troops that are retreating back along the river, and we get the unit destroyed. Southern, we don't get a bonus for a unit destroyed per se, but if he wants to reform that unit and use it again, he's got to spend political points. So that's kind of the, the bonus. The real the real bonus here is that we lost one squad, which a Chinese infantry squad is worth one-sixth of a victory point. So really we lost two squads, one combatant, one infantry. So we lost one-third of, an in, one of a victory point is what we lost. He lost 75, 18, 14... Uh, victory points. I believe engineers and non-combatants all count for one. Squads definitely do. So, you know, he lost 107 victory points to our one-third of a victory point. So that was a very good result for us in the victory point department. Uh, we retook a key base. We opened the supply line back to Chungking for this force here of about 5,000 assault value. And I'm hoping we can get now both these formations across the river here. The guys that were at Changtha and are retreating and the guys that were at Changsha and are retreating so that we can station probably about 3,500 victory points on each of these hexes, which both have rough terrain. So when he crosses the river there, he's going to get a, a, a negative three assault penalty as well as being forced to shock attack. I'm, I'm hopeful that that makes central China... Uh, a little bit of a slog for him. He can. Here's the thing, though. He can replace the infantry squads that he loses. Manpower is probably not an issue, but it really just comes down to the fact that one, he's going to have to use victory. He loses victory points for the casualties, and two, he's got to use political points if he wants to reform that destroyed unit. And and you want as many sort of free headquarter regiments as you can get. I think if he reforms it, it's not attached to a restricted headquarter, so he can move it wherever he wants. But that takes time. And the 46 guns are also something that his industry needs to replace. Again, I'm sure he can do it, but it's it's 46 guns that won't be going to another unit. And it's 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 also, you know, if he if he decides to reform that regiment, those are squads and guns that won't be going to the troops in and around Singapore that are losing all those casualties. Yeah, I think it's like what, 30 to 60 days or 45 days, somewhere in there that he has to wait. So again, that's a month. Time is money for the allies. Meanwhile, we get a bunch of AIF pioneer battalions that are arriving in Aden. We get some fighter wings and other groups like that that are arriving uh, in uh, Sydney and across Australia. I don't think these are truly new units. I think these are guys that are arriving from strategic moves, but I could be wrong on that. I don't think these are all newly formed units, though. The New Zealanders definitely are, though. 20th Indian Division arrives at Bangalore. That's great. These might actually be newly formed units. Um, can you use captured monkeys, brass monk, or captured weapons, brass monkey? I don't think so. Well, he gets part of the unit. Then he can use. He can spend spend resources to fill the unit up. So Singapore held. It didn't lose any of its fortifications. Its assault value only dropped by 50. So these troops are actually still in pretty damn good shape. Their morale is dropping from the constant attacks from the Japanese. So that's not great. That'll that'll impact their fighting ability. But they all have good supply. Their experience is getting better. These guys are up to 50 experience. Some of the units are 70, but I think those are mostly support units. 
Um, you can see here the Manchester Battalion, 56, 53 for the Dogra Battalion. I really should have looked at these units to see what their experience level was before the Battle of Singapore started. Some of the units, like the heavy AA guns, are still very low. Uh, but most of these guys are all 50+, plus, so the, the quality is going up. Some of them still have good morale. Some of them don't. The SS uh, VF Brigade does not. Uh, they've also taken massive casualties. They started with 108 Malayan squads. They're down to 32 effectives with 35 disabled. Uh, nonetheless, my hope is that, that that severe defeat forces him to delay a couple of days, maybe even a week. I doubt he'll wait a week. He'll probably just bring in more reinforcements via sea. But at the end of the day, um, my hope originally before today was that Singapore could hold out for about another week. And with that last result, I think there's a pretty good chance of that. I don't think he's going to keep attacking. I mean, if he does, you can see the last turn was not a good result for him. He's far weaker relatively than I am going into the next battle. We still have 20,000 supply here. We've got 52,000 fuel as well, which means we're going to turn that fuel into supply as well. We still have our uh, our industry turned on. So heavy industry turns, I think it's 20 supply, 20 fuel points turns into two supply, I think it is, or like some, some amount of resources turns into supply as well. So while we're at 20,000, we're still manufacturing our own supply at Singapore. So that's good for us. Palembang, meanwhile, which is probably next and hasn't been reinforced enough, is, is only a level 2 fort. I'm kind of... So we've got the carriers back here, guys. And with the fall of Bandar Jasmine, I think we have to pull them out because they will be sort of uh, at extreme torpedo range. This is about 15 hexes away. A Nell can carry torpedoes out to 15 hexes. Now, he can only bring zero fighter escorts out to 14 hexes. The Nell can actually go to like 18 or 20, 20 hexes. However, honestly, if he's going to send unescorted Nells, I would be 100% behind that. Like, yes, there's a risk we would take a couple of bombs, but he couldn't drop he couldn't drop torps, and he'd be coming in unescorted. We would absolutely shoot them to pieces. Um, so that's that's a good result. Um, if if he's if he detects us, he hasn't detected us yet. You can see there's no detection there. We think he might have detected us because of some subs that we used our aircraft against back in Australia like a week ago, or maybe a little less than a week ago. Uh, we had some anti-submarine attacks from our from our aircraft on our carrier, so that might have given them a way that they're on the western tip of Australia. But I don't think he knows where they are. Um, we know that he's probably got the mini Kidubutai in this area. Um, but uh, I don't know. So my plan at this point is to put the carriers a little bit further away, pull them away from Bandar Jasmine. They could be in long-range patrol radiuses with the enemy. The weather also looks like it's going to be clear, which means that they'd probably get spotted if they're too close. But if they're further away, the odds of detection are much less. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send the carriers north so that they're a little bit west of Palembang. And in the event that he, he sends a landing force down to Palembang, I think... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think we could sit here. I think we could sit here and bomb with dive bombers any any naval forces that he has at Palembang, bring our fighters in at escort, and also remain out of range of any long-range bombers that he might have based at, I don't think he has anything at Mersing, but anything he might have at Kuatan or at Swing Kang. So I think we could sit here, and if he makes a move toward Palembang, we could potentially give him a little bit of a bloody nose. Maybe not set the invasion back entirely, because I think he'd land before we actually drop any ordnance on him. And then we could skirt out of there before he has a chance to change. Um, I think that's my thought. I do know that he had a sub operating near Oosthaven like a week or two ago. I'm not sure if, if he still does. We haven't had much in the way of shipping in that area, so we'll see. I'm also debating sending one tanker into Oosthaven and one into Tijalap. Tijalap, again, would be at, at the extreme range of enemy torpedo bombers out of Bandar Jasmine, but we don't think he's going to have torpedoes um, at Bandar Jasmine for a little bit. So I'm tempted to bring a tanker in here. He's focusing his air attacks on Sura, Sura Bajaha, or however you pronounce that. So again, if we can pull 7,000 more fuel out of Java, uh, it could be worth the risk. Additionally... Um, I might try the same thing with Oosthaven 
and maybe we'd lure some kind of attack in that we could use our use our carriers against uh, with a sort of strategic surprise. That's my thought, operating in the fringe of his land-based bomber's maximum range. Based off my own calculations, this route will avoid any torpedo range of any bombers operating out of Bandar Jasmine, and he won't have any bombers there this turn, because I think it takes a full turn to transport the aircraft before they can actually start bombing. Furthermore, with the range that my guys are at, I'm hoping that we avoid any detection, and I'm a little bit further west of Oosthaven, so barring like a an enemy float plane seeing me off a sub, I don't think there's a high degree of likelihood that uh, that he'll detect my carriers in their present position. Like a G-man, he can. So the issue with hitting hitting the issue with hitting Bandar Jasmine now is we know he has torpedoes out of Ma uh, Mascar, right? Didn't we see some G3M Nels? Were they out of Mascar? Where were those? Or maybe that was over by Port Moresby. Maybe that wasn't Mascar. Still, I'm going to assume that he's got torpedo bombers out of Mascar. Given the airfield's a level 3 in the area, it's probably his best airfield. It's either that or he's got it out, out of Kendari, but Kendari's too far to the rear. So I'm going to guess he's got... I mean, we've seen Nels bombing Surabaya. So I'm guessing that he's got torpedoes set up in Mascar. So if I move the, the fleet into the Java Sea, that is taking a tremendous risk because anything east of Java would be in range of, of theoretically, would be in range of torpedo bombers based out of either Mascar, Kendari, Balak Papin, any of those bases. And I would not be able to hit Bandar Jasmine unless I move into the Java Sea. I can't get close enough on the west side of Java to hit Bandar Jasmine. So I really need to stay west of Java. Additionally, if I move into Java, that's shallow waters. That's very easy for him to, to detect me. We've seen over 60 enemy fighters of Oscars and, and Zeros. We've seen indications of enemy carriers as well, light carriers, not the fleet carriers, but light carriers operating in that area. And the light carriers carry torpedoes as well. So that seems like a really bad idea to be in a situation where there's at least 60 enemy fighters and enemy torpedo bombers and enemy Nels all within easy striking range of our carriers. It would seem foolish to me to send any carriers in to the Java Sea uh, unless I wanted them to be sunk. It would be fun to give, the, to give him a bloody nose with the carriers at Singapore. I, here's the here's the problem, though. Again, we know he's got a large number of bombers operating on Malaya. I haven't seen Nels or Betty's, but I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past him to have some anti-shipping capabilities up in that area. I would if I was him. So again, his his Betty's or whatever aircraft he has can really control the sea off the Malayan Peninsula, like out to this area, sort of on a on a on a on a bit of a, a bit of a circular path here. And I really don't want to move the carriers in there. I can't hit from the west side of Sumatra either. It's too many hexes away. My dive bombers, I think, have a range of seven. And it would be like, we'd have to be like here to be able to hit. That just is asking for a lot of problems. I, I, there's no reason to move in that close as much as I would like to. Um, you know, it would not be, I don't think it would be terribly prudent. And let's be honest, unless I brought like six battleships in to hit him with a massive bombardment, I don't think I would do that much damage anyway. How do we deal with them in the future when we want to start reclaiming territory? Well, in the future, allied air crews get more experienced. They get more effective. Um, the Japanese get a bunch of perks to the zero into the, I don't know about the Oscar, but they get maneuver perks to the zero up until June, I believe it is. Um, that sort of match with the historical learning curve that the allied pilots had to, had to experience fighting the zero a lot before they really learned how they could beat it. Uh, and so... Every month, his maneuver bonus drops by one, is my understanding of the rule, so that by June, that maneuver bonus will be gone, and you'll start to see bonuses for the allies as well, so that the allies will be better against enemy fighters. The Nell is always a kind of a glass cannon. They, they have no durability. They get shot down incredibly easily, but, you know, it's a risk. It, it is definitely a risk. I've not renamed the Carrier Task Forces to the 3rd and 5th Fleet. For my role play purposes yet, Sean Mack. Third and fifth weren't formed yet, were they? I could give the task force a name, though. You can do that. You can see here we've got the Lexington, Saratoga, and Enterprise. And then we've got the Yorktown and Indomitable. So we've got five carriers operating in this area. Again, we're going to send these guys west of Palembang in sort of this one gap, I think, that he's going to have in torpedo coverage for now. And we'll just see what, what develops. 
I don't think I can rename ships. I don't think I can rename ships. I can name task forces, not ships. The carrier task force needs a catchy name. Well, when I have a reason for, for a catchy name, I'll give them one. One other uh, uh, thing worth calling out, the 6th Australian Division, a crack division coming in from the desert of North Africa, is on its way to Perth. She's almost there. She's 21 hexes away. She moves three per phase, so that means six hexes per day, which would make her three and a half, so basically four days away from bringing this large task force and an entire crack Australian infantry division into Perth. We do know there are enemy submarines about. We do have a pretty strong ASW escort screening this formation. Three flower class corvettes, all level four anti-submarine technology. One destroyer escort, escort of the Bittern class, six anti-submarine technology. So the hope is that these guys can provide an effective escort. They're following the formation. The formation also has a destroyer, a Dutch destroyer, or actually it's an N-class destroyer, I think. Yeah, eight anti-submarines. So it's got a crack anti-submarine destroyer with it. Um, that should help. Only one destroyer in the task force, however. Um, I'm operating under the assumption that the ASW task force is going to be a little bit more effective than direct escorts. So I can rename a ship before it commissions? That's good to know. Ship availability, the Hornets arriving in 11 days in the eastern U.S. Um, I have thought about one idea that I had was because of these land-based bombers right now, I thought about maybe sprinting or moving the carriers off map to Cape Town. Once they're off map, then what I would do is I would set them to flank speed and sprint them to the Panama Canal and redistribute them to the eastern coast in a very quick time. I think it's about a 30-day transit time between Colombo and at least in the U.S. East Coast at 12 knots. However, I could send them on flank speed. They don't take system damage and they don't use fuel when they're moving off map to off map. So I could probably move them in like 10 days, I'm thinking, uh, from one to the other. And um, that would be kind of cool because then we could just like in, in 12 to 13 days or something like that, we might be able to completely move them to the other side of the world and uh, and get these guys, you know, maybe surprise uh, XTRG, um, you know, by flipping them to the other side of the map. I mean, Mexicans, it's a long time without the carriers, sort of, but it's also, I can't really do much in the Dutch East Indies right now with the carriers. I don't want to engage the Japanese fleet carriers at this time, so I think it's more about keeping XTRG off guard where they're at and keeping him sort of guessing and then using him where I can. Speaking of XTRG's carriers, folks, you see this red dot right here, or these two red ship icons? How much you want to bet that's the Kitty Butai? Remember, they sank the cane last turn. Um, I did have another destroyer coming formation coming down from Pearl. Two more four stackers of the Wix class, uh, so old World War I destroyers. I have ordered them to fall back to Pearl. There's no reason for them to risk themselves now that the enemy has uncovered themselves. Uh, we can see here that there is a uh, formation here and it's a big one guys if we hover our mouse over it look at that 57 fighters 136 bombers 27 auxiliaries if the intelligence is even remotely correct that is at least three enemy fleet carriers you can see they're reporting four but we don't really know how accurate that report is they're also reporting an enemy heavy cruiser three enemy battleships and a tanker this is the Kitty Butai. This is the big Japanese carrier formation. The bomber numbers seem a little bit low. I don't know if that's just bad intel or if he's broken the Kitty Butai up. If he has broken the Kitty Butai up, that's a pretty risky thing for the Japanese to do. That's asking for trouble. Uh, typically, the Japanese player, in my experience, wants to keep all six of his carriers concentrated in a single formation. Otherwise, he is much more likely to run into a midway type scenario where he gets himself clobbered by the Allies. The problem is February is still a little bit too early for the Americans to go sink or go searching for a carrier battle 
outside of maybe striking at a CVL. It's it's just a little bit risky right now. And frankly, it doesn't matter because my carriers are literally on the other side of the world. Um, so we've detected them. They're moving east. My guess is he's trying to move between Pearl and between Palmyra, either to position himself somewhere north of Palmyra and launch some strikes there, or to get in amongst our shipping. You can see there is a lot of shipping to the east of Palmyra. Now, that's a long way for him to go. That is a long distance for him to carry fuel, and that is something that uh, that would be, be uh, you know, I'm sure he's going to, if he's not going to do it, if he doesn't have the fuel, but that's a lot of fuel for him to be operating this far east to be using. He's got to have a lot of tankers and support vessels operating in the area. Um, there's a couple of things that are working in our favor, I think, right now. One is most of these transports are headed back. So there is one convoy that's headed directly south. You can see here there's some AKs and some destroyers. It's not a super valuable task force. You can see six victory points, seven victory points, five victory points, six, six. There's one ten there. I think that might be the only ship in the entire task force that's worth more than ten victory points. It's a relatively not so valuable task force. Um, it is a good number of ships, so it does add up, but this is just not a lot of... of uh, it, it's not as bad as it would look if you hit it. Additionally, they're moving directly south, so he's still a ways away. He's still like 18 hexes west. So assuming he moves, you know, to here this turn, um, or even to here... I think they're going to be they're going to be probably down here. So they're probably going to be too far for him to strike unless he blitzes in at flank speed. But frankly, if he blitzes in with flank speed, it's probably a one turn show because he's not going to have fuel to burn flank speed this far out and be able to do much. Um, so there's that. Additionally, outside of that, we do have one surface task force here that I'm going to pull back a little bit. A heavy cruiser, a light cruiser, and three and some destroyers. I definitely don't want to lose them. So they're probably going to pull back to right around here by the end of this turn. So I'm guessing, again, unless he moves at flank speed, they're probably relatively safe. If he does hit them, I mean, it would suck. The Portland is worth 40 victory points. She's a Portland class. She's a good cruiser class. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. Um, the rest of the, uh, this convoy is detected by the way. I'm not sure by what, I don't think there's any way it's detected by the carriers. So we might have some subs operating in this area. Cause I don't think he can use carrier detection that far out. There might be a float plane off an enemy submarine in the area. Uh, that's something to be mindful of. So we're going to pull these cruisers back. We've also got this other task force here, which is actually quite a few AKs. Um, these guys, the task force is worth a little bit more, but, um, you can see here, a lot of shipping here, all empty, no supplies or anything like. Relatively cheap, though. Again, the uh, the allies get a lot of merchant shipping, so we could lose one of these and it won't hurt us too bad. Um, but it's also moving northeast, so hopefully by the time, like even if he gets to here, it's going to be like out here. That's a really long place. He'd have to sprint a couple of turns to try and catch him. Uh, I have switched them over to flank speed. They can't quite make it there in one in, in on flank all the way, but flank speed will bump these guys up to I think three, so they'll be out to here. I mean, tankers are or transports are slow. He hasn't detected them yet though. Um, meanwhile, there's more task forces over here. These guys are headed to Australia. They're headed south. They're a little bit faster, a little bit more valuable. These guys are headed to Los Angeles. There's some fleet oilers here who are headed to Los Angeles. Um, these uh, trans troop transports are headed to Los Angeles. Uh, we've also got tankers here headed to Los Angeles. There's quite a lot of valuable shipping here, but almost all of it is headed back to Los Angeles. So it's headed the opposite direction. So unless he really has the logistical capabilities to split the gap between Hawaii and Palmyra, and unless he really wants to push like 20 to 30 hexes east, and he's got the fuel to do that, he's going to have a hard time doing too much damage. The key here is that our tr our, most of our ships are moving the wrong direction for him. Um, and so, and that's a deliberate. And so, you know, we, we should be able to get, I mean, these guys back to port before, um, before, um, he can really do anything about it. Um, with that being said, we do have some shipping that we need to be mindful of. We've got these tankers down here, which are headed to Australia. They're way east and south. So by the time he gets in there, I'm thinking they'll be, they'll be well clear to the south. We have some other shipping. 
uh, which we're, we need to be, I think we need to just see how this develops because we've got a couple of other convoys and tankers here. We could just turn him around if we see him, if we see him split the gap and he's a threat there. The one big threat, it's pretty safe right now, but the one big threat I want to be careful with, the American Infantry Division is over this way. Now they're way far over here, but if he really does rush into this gap, it's slow enough that that could be a problem. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to send the American Infantry Division off map to Panama. We'll see how things develop. If if we need to, we'll turn them around. Otherwise, I may actually send them directly from Panama to Australia from the west. It's slow. It's going to take like a month to do that. But it's probably going to take about a month, maybe half a month, to get them to Australia anyway. So I don't want to lose them. Off map, they're safe. So we'll, we may consider doing that. Uh, additionally, I'm, I'm doing something similar for our, some of our fighter groups and other things like that. I'm moving them off map mainly just to see what happens with them, but we'll move them, we'll move them, um, you know, uh, effectively either off map if the carriers are going to linger in this area, or we will, we'll keep them back on map and, and move them, um, you know, once, once things lighten up here. But I am sending my troop convoys off map because those are just, those are too risky to risk even though he's still kind of far away from any of that. <sighs> yeah, we'll probably need to make more use of what fast transports we do have. We'll see. Smaller groups aren't always aren't always safer. I will add that also, guys. The thing you have to remember with smaller convoys is if there's more convoys, there's a greater likelihood that a sub will stumble upon one. And smaller convoys for transporting troops tends to mean that your troops are concentrated in fewer ships, which means each ship that they do sink does more damage. Um, yes, in theory, but most of our ships sort of have uniform speed. I tend to form formations with shipping that all has the same speed. So I tend to form formations of shipping that all has 14 knots, all has 12 knots, etc. for that very reason. Um, carriers at Pearl, or sorry, not carriers, battleships at Pearl. The Oklahoma should be ready in a little bit less than a month. Uh, the So we'll have one more battleship there. We already have a good number of healthy battleships at Pearl. We've got six battleships, one of, one of them British, the other uh, five are Americans. We also have a battleship at San Diego that's being repaired. 174 more days for the Pennsylvania. The Arizona and Maryland, both who survived Pearl Harbor. The Maryland will be ready in 26 days. The Arizona in uh, just less than three months. Mirror Island. West Virginia, 113 days. I think that's about it out there. If we move west to Cape Town and we take a look at our battleships out that way, we've got three battleships currently at um, Cape Town. We've got two British battleships here, the Ramillies and the Resolution. When do they have to withdraw, by the way? Withdrawal? Okay, the, not for a long time. December of 43. Royal Sovereign class. And then under repair, we have the Repulse and the Prince of Wales. I don't think the Repulse moved down a day. I think it was 69 days last turn, so she didn't get uh, didn't get any further repaired. Um, the Prince of Wales, 296 days, a little bit less than a year still. I also did take your guys' advice. I am going to move my – I had some uh, cruisers that were moving to Cape Town to repair, but because that shipyard's pretty full, we're going to move them to Colombo. The thing is, is it takes two days for them to turn around. There's an ordered turnaround, so it'll take two days till they get off back off map, and then they're gonna head up to Colombo. Uh, maybe Pat, but I don't want to send any battleships to the South Pacific until those enemy carriers clear, because I've got no air cover for those those uh, those poor battleships. They will get just wiped out at sea if we run into the enemy fleet carriers. So we definitely want to wait for this formation to clear before we send anything of substance out of Pearl. Meanwhile, I did move a few additional air units into Palmyra. It's only a level 2 airfield, so I don't think I can bomb with B-17s out of there. But I did move some B-18 bolos. 
So I'm going to try, if the enemy gets within range, within 11 hexes, I'm going to send them in on naval attack. I don't know if two-engine bombers work on skip, skip bombing at the same way that four-engine level bombers do. The Bolo definitely isn't as, as durable as the B-17. But uh, I'm going to send the Bolos in at 1,000 feet on naval attack to see if we can't score a lucky hit. Uh, the Bolo does not carry torpedoes. So if we take a look at the Bolo, it carries either five or four 500-pound bombs or two 500-pound bombs. Basically, it's a B-25 payload. The PBYs can carry up to two. Um, I'm debating switching some of them over to naval attack, but they're pretty tired because I ran them at 100% search because I really wanted to detect the enemies. The enemy shipping here. You can see the enemy, if it continues moving east, is going to move firmly into our detection zone. Where we've got all of our, uh, you can see here the search cones for the different different air groups. It's the B-25 that really let itself go. Well, it's it's actually, it's like the group B-25's grandfather, right? Didn't the Bolo, the Bolo was the design that evolved into the B-17? I think. But I'm sure it also sort of inspired the B-25 as well. So, but I think the Bolo came before the B-17. The Bolo was not really a thing in World War II, as far as I know. I think it was it was already sort of being phased out by the time uh, by the time the war started. We have a few in the pool, but um, we could look for subs in the rear, Pat. But honestly, I don't think it'll do us much good unless I want to move some ASW task forces. PBYs will do a good job of finding the subs for you. They won't do a good job of killing the subs for you at this stage in the war. So detecting the subs might be nice, but it won't. I'm not going to operate ASW task forces as the carriers move in. Um, one thing I will say I noticed is the B-17s out of Suva didn't fly or didn't didn't find anything last turn. We changed their order to naval attack. We tried to do skip bombing last turn. We ordered them to naval attack, but then we had a secondary order of port attack. So if there were no enemy naval vessels that they could attack, then they would bomb the port of Espirito Santo again. I'm not sure why they didn't, uh, they didn't bomb anything, but uh, they didn't. So there does still appear to be a tanker uh, at, uh, at uh, Luganville. I'd love for them to bomb that tanker, but I've had no indication that they're going to. So not sure about that. Meanwhile, Kushin, thank you very much for the subscription there with Prime. That's nine months now. Greatly appreciated. Yeah, a bunch of B-18s were destroyed at Pearl. We've got a few still. They're still making a few. But yes, generally speaking, um, a large number were lost at Pearl. I have listened to you guys, and rather than moving my subs to Port Moresby to lay a minefield there, I'm actually going to swing them around to Buna and try and lay an offensive minefield there. Now, there's only 62 mines, so it's not going to do huge damage. Uh, I need to get a few more mines in there. I did order another mine laying task force of subs over here, but it's only going to bring eight more mines. Frankly, we just don't have enough mines to be laying large numbers of minefields at this point in time. The, the pools, the production of mines is still too low. But that'll give us 72 mines, maybe, or 70 mines. Maybe we'll get a chance to hit something with one of those into Buna, and it'll make him think twice. I'd love to move my cruiser mine layer up that way too, but with all the enemy air, uh, I think it's probably just safer to move it in. I'm going to drop the mines at Townsville. So the cruiser mine layer here is a Dutch cruiser mine layer. It carries Mark II mines. The subs carry Mark VIII. Um, and we're going to drop 45 of them at Townsville. I think Townsville could be a, a potential landing zone. Canaris or Cairns maybe as well. Um, but I think the most likely, if he does land on the west coast of Australia, if he lands at, at Brisbane, he triggers reinforcements to arrive for us in the Middle East. I doubt he'll land too close to Brisbane. I think most likely is he would take Moresby, and then he would either go for Cooktown as sort of a staging area. He can build a nice airfield there, but the roads are pretty crappy there, so I don't know if he'd really move much there. Um, but then he could also move into Cairns, which is on a major rail line, uh, and would kind of put us in a bit of a tricky spot. So I think that's more likely. So we're going to lay mines at Townsville and at Cairns. Uh, as sort of a, a detriment to uh, any any enemy landings there. He didn't attack Port Moresby there last turn. Um, you can see our defense here actually bumped back up a little bit. I think it was down to like 250. Now it's back up to 278. I could be wrong on that um, from a turn of rest. We've got over 9,000 supplies, so there's that. 
I also did go ahead and adjust my A24 Banshee. Someone was telling me that you need a higher altitude to effectively dive bomb with these guys. So I moved them up to 15,000 feet. They were at five. I think you're right. I think uh, dive bombing doesn't occur unless you're at least at 15,000 feet. So I did move them up to that. I, uh, I also switched the whirlaways over to naval attack. They're kind of crappy. They're not going to do much damage to shipping with 100-pound bombs. But they're also basically negligible in their attacks on the Japanese division at Moresby. So, uh, you know, there's that. Um, our B-17s at Charlestown, I wanted to try and get them to bomb the enemy formation out at Ley, but it's literally one hex beyond their range. It would be 17 hexes instead of, instead of, uh, or sorry, 19 hexes instead of, uh, 18. So I can't bomb that far, but I have switched them to naval attack because, uh, Buna would be in range. So if he does bring transport down to Buna, I could try and skip bomb them with our, with our 17s out of Australia and maybe have a little bit of success there. 10,000 for die bombers? Okay. I thought it was 15, but in, e in, e in either event. Buna is critical because it's, I, it, I believe it's his only feasible way to draw supply into Moresby. He could theoretically go from Salamua, but that's over two hexes with no roads and through mountains. I think that's unlikely. The Kodiak Trail is dicey as it is. There's no roadway there. Um, there's no ro no roadway hex there. There is a roadway hex into Moresby, which represents the Kodiak Trail, but there's no easy supply route that way. Uh, thanks, Stein. Yeah, they are. They're, they're going well. Uh, maybe I should bring the carriers further out. I don't know. Maybe it's not worth the risk. I don't think it's much of a risk. Meanwhile, apparently our base force retreated along the railway line south to Singapore. So I'm hopeful that cuts his supply. I don't know if it does or not. I didn't realize these guys are moving here. They've got a couple of infantry squads here they've got two infantry squads he drove these guys out of some other base i wasn't even trying doing do i wasn't even trying to do that they they were at i think tavoy and then he attacked tavoy and they retreated so they may have cut his supply line from a railway perspective down to singapore um but i can't imagine they're going to survive long there because they don't have very much in the way of supplies the morale is at five they could vanish any turn but maybe that cuts his railway line and forces him to do more with shipping. I mean, he can definitely ship supplies in. Fiji doesn't seem viable long term when he brings Cap from Luganville. That's a long way to bring Cap. So Luganville is a good airfield for him. And he can definitely base bombers out of there to hit Fiji. But that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10... Uh, I'm doing that wrong. I don't think his fighters can reach there. I'm counting that's 16, maybe if we're generous, 15 hexes. The A6M20 can make it 14 with drop tanks on extended range. They get some pretty big penalties in terms of ops losses if he's using them out at that range. Um, that would be a horrible horrible way for him to use his zeros they would lose a ton of attrition that would be a really bad idea his bombers could hit us but that would probably not be a great idea same for his base at nomaya if he really wants to reduce fiji with land-based fighters i think he needs to build up tana which can have a level five airfield and is much closer um or even a fate either of these two islands would be better options funafuti would also be an option but it doesn't have uh, the capability for a large airstrip, certainly not efficiency, efficiently, and Vatabupi, uh, same. So I really think he'd either need to figure out a way to build up Savi or take the Horn or Wallace Islands or take some of these other undefended islands north of, north of Fiji. Honestly, I think his best way to crush Fiji is moving the carriers in. Um, Fiji has a pretty strong air force there for us already. We've got 53 fighter aircraft, all of them relatively modern, 18 Wildcats, 17 P-40Bs, 18 Buffaloes. We also have uh, 30 heavy bombers, 30 B-17s are operating out of, out of Fiji. Additionally, we have some 36 Dauntless dive bombers. So essentially, we have two carriers, we have two to three carriers worth of aircraft uh, at, at, uh, at Fiji to, to stop him. I think he really, it would take a little bit of time. We all, we also have a good amount of supply. There's over 20,000 supply at this base already. 
So that's a good amount of supply. We've got a, a few additional Hudson's and Catalina's over here. The other sort of interesting piece is that Pago Pago is close enough. So we can't move the P40Bs. They can't fly that far. But we have 19 or 16 P40Es, which we can load up with drop tanks and we could transfer them to Fiji. So we could give an influx of another 16 modern fighters. We also have 13 B-26 Marauders, which have the range to transfer to Fiji as well. So we could supplement Fiji because Pago and Suva can both support each other in defense. Not by launching airstrikes from both, but by transferring aircraft back and forth, they can really help each other. Additionally, we did land some troops on Vavu down here in sort of the center between Pago and between Suva. We've got additional reinforcements on the way. We've got another base force on the way down here, as well as another element of a Marine regiment. So we brought in the 2nd Marine regiment, most of it. There's a little bit of it that's still further behind. The 2nd U.S. Marine parachute unit and the 101st base force. We're going to bring in the rem remnants of the 101st base force and the 2nd Marine regiment so that we'll have about 160 assault value on this island. Still won't be as strong as Pago, which is up over 300. That's basically a division worth, or Suva, which is at 300. We also have Nadi, where we formed the 1st Australian Division. So it's a kind of a glass jaw division. It's militia sections. Um, we really want it to have regular infantry, but we don't have the troops in the pool for that yet. Um, but uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, we've got, you know, 600 assault value. Um, actually, 350, 650 assault value on the island of Fiji between a good American infantry regiment, a good Australian infantry brigade, and then two bad Australian uh, force units, a brigade and a division. Nonetheless, it would take a substantial commitment of forces for him to take to take Fiji. Um, he could do it. He definitely could, but it would take a substantial amount of effort. Um, once we uh, once we build uh, Vavu up, the P-40B, which can't make it directly to Fiji this way, would be able to transfer to Vavu, and then it would also be able to transfer to Suva, Suva that way. But the uh, but Vavu doesn't have an airfield yet. Uh, it's at zero. So we're building that up. You can see here we're 8% of the way to a level one airfield. Uh, we already have 36 aviation support on the island. So these three bases are intended to be sort of self-supporting or, or sort of, sorry, they should, they're intended to support each other. It's intended to be a ring of fortifications that each support e each other. They're a little bit further apart than I would like. Um, but once once that happens, we can shuttle troops back and forth and, or, and air units back and forth to assist each other. We're also working on building the fortifications up. So we're already at three at each one of these bases. We're working on getting up to four. If we can get to five, that would be great. Five would make a landing much more difficult. Although Japan has some pretty big amphibious landing bonuses up until I think June as well. Uh, but that being said, uh, we're, we're working on turning these guys into fortresses. So that's the intent with sort of this Fiji line down here is having interlocking fields of support. Uh, and I, I just think his current bases are a little bit too remote, a little bit too far off to effectively suppress us. And if he does try and start launching some bombing operations against Fiji, that's going to burn a lot of supply. That's going to be difficult to logistically support. He could move the Kitty down here probably and crush this entire force, this entire air force in two or three days of bombing, maybe even one. Um, but it would it would require a heavy commitment, and he would probably lose a fair number of aircraft in the exchange. And again, because of the way these bases are, are interlocked, I think we could we could sort of repair the damage relatively quickly. If he lands in Fiji, we get a New Zealand division. I didn't know that. Interesting. Um, we also got some new forces down here in Auckland. You can see we've got about 400 assault value down here. We did move an American tank battalion down here, a combat infantry regiment, or sorry, combat engineer regiment. Uh, Wellington also raised some new troops as well. So you can see about 300 here. First Wellington battalion, Tarnaki, Hawkins. We'll build these guys into the second New Zealand brigade. Uh, engineers are not in strat, so we're building fortifications all all in New Zealand as well. Uh, Sean, I don't think we have a Mexican standoff. He can definitely push in places. the The Palmyra side is definitely going to, if he wanted to push at Palmyra, he could. We have very weak defenses here. 
Hey, Happy Blitzkrieg, thanks for the follow. So we have a very weak formation at Palmyra, and if he got ba Nels in here, that would really... I mean, our supply line is already stretched thanks to New Caledonia being in his control. That's that's adding like 20% transit time to Australia, so that already messes with our with our slock. Um, but uh, it, it's, you know, losing Palmyra or Christmas Island would be very problematic. Uh, we do have a Canadian brigade at Christmas Island, but they're mostly militia, so again, they would not hold out very well. Um... I don't think, I'm hoping this isn't a landing force at Palmyra. I am not sure what to do with these guys. So we've got two cargo ships down here with troops on them. Um, the formation isn't very valuable, but there's there's troops on them. So I could either try and run these guys south and hope he doesn't detect them because they're not detected yet, or I can run them into Palmyra. They're two hexes away. They move two hexes, so they'll get there by morning. But the question is, does he move close enough to bomb Palmyra and then if he bombs Palmyra, does he wipe these troops out on their transport? Honestly, I think it's probably too late to pull them out. I think we just have to race them in, hope we can get most of them off. If he doesn't hit us today, we should get the majority of the infantry ashore. The support equipment might take another day or two, but if it can take three days before he bombs them, then we're great. If it's two days, we're still probably in decent shape, but, um, but it really depends on, on how he reacts. It doesn't need to. It doesn't need to dock them, Pat. This is an amphibious task force, and these guys are in combat formation, so they can unload over the beach. I could split the formation, and maybe one of them would dock. I think they're going to unload over the beach no matter what, though, because they're amphibious. Um. Whoops. I'm going to try it. Probably doesn't hurt. I don't really know how the rules will work for that. I'd rather not send the destroyer straight at him. I think my plan is as soon as, like, if he doesn't attack us this turn, I'm going to blitz the destroyer out of there. I don't want to lose... A destroyer unnecessarily. The cane served a purpose. I'm not sure that sending another destroyer at him will... I mean, so here's the thing. You saw last turn that he launched two air raids against the destroyer to wipe it out. If he had better rolls, it could have been one. And all it ate up was 36 of his dive bombers. If he's got four carriers there... He can hit the destroyer and he can hit the other task force. His, his carrier formation can hit multiple task forces all at once. So it really won't save us. It'll just divide his attack between multiple task forces. Uh, Happy Blitzkrieg. This game is called War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition. Troop limits on small islands, I just make sure that I don't put more than 6,000 men on this island. So this island has a, has a stack limit of 6,000 men. Currently, it has uh, 2,600 on the island. The current formation is going to bring another 800 there and about, I don't know, 1,000 equipment. How many men? Another 400 men here. So about 1,200 more men are going to gonna come ashore, assuming they get ashore. That'll bring us up to about 3,800 out of the potential 6,000. If you have more than 6,000, you get major penalties. Yeah, Happy Blitzkrieg. This is very much a one-of-a-kind game. It's not, it's not cheap, though. It is, in terms of pricing, the better way to think about this is, like, this is priced competitively with, like, gigantic garage board games, because that's really what it is. Like, a board game would cost you that much if it was, like, you know... 10 feet by 10 feet with like 10 with like a thousand chits that's really the better the better comp comp to this it's a world war ii game that allows you to play world war ii out one day at a time so each turn is one day i've been playing against xtrg the player i'm playing against he has another youtube channel for about a year and we're just into february of 1942 okay 
Um, what I will say though is, if you are interested, Happy, uh, keep an eye on on Matrix. They do run sales. Uh, I think around Easter, this game was on sale for sixteen bucks. So, um, or maybe it was like twenty bucks. But they do run sales from time to time, and it can be a pretty good deal. It is also like a twelve-year-old game, so they've you know they're not. By this point, you know each sale is great for them, but I don't know. I don't know how much they're really selling. And I don't think if they lowered prices, there'd be an influx. It's a very finicky kind of a game. Yeah, single player, you can definitely make good progress. Um, it's much plus the AI is much more forgiving, so you don't have to be quite as picky with your with your with your movements and your units and all of that. Um, okay, let me think here. So, Batavia, you wanted to see Fort Level of Batavia. Batavia Fort level is up to 46%. Three forts already, but 46% of the way to level four. The formation there is eight, 786 assault value, large number of KNL regiments. Good morale right now. I'm curious how quick that'll fall once they start getting bombed. Actually, not the worst experience I've seen by the troops. Surabaya, meanwhile, 204 assault value, 81 of that is a fixed unit here, the artillery commandos, coastal defense unit that I can't move. I don't think I can move the base force unit either, so about 120 of that is, is formations I can't move. We have two Langstrom battalions that I could move. They're currently set to strat to be able to rail out of there as quickly as possible. I don't think he's going to land in Sorabaya. I think he will probably land at Bandajawai. Or, now that he's got the base here at Bandar Jasmine, he could land at Tepo uh, or Sermang. He may land at Sermang and try and use the good road here between Dojakara to cut the uh, cut our, our lines in half. That's why we're sitting these other formations in strat moves, so they don't have to wait to pack up. So if he does land here, that we can blitz west to Batavia before they get cut off on the other end of the island. Deck gun refits for the subs. Um, kind of depends on the sub, right? April for these guys, I think. Well, they both have 3-inch Mark 5010 guns, so I'm not sure. Looks like they'll get radar. You know, he's got the float planes, but when we get radar, that's going to that's going to be pretty awesome. Um I have not played War in, well, I I own War in the West. I can't say I've really played it much. War in the Pacific is much more to my taste. They did a lot of streamlining and things that made War in the West more playable than this, but I really don't like the weekly turns. That really turns me off. <laughs> this looks like most of the upgrades there are, uh, are radar upgrades. Uh, anything else we want to look at? Probably the troops in China. So these guys made it across the river to Chikikong. They drew supply last turn, so they're a little bit low on supply here. Uh, they're very low, but they did just pull full supply for all these units here. So you can see the 74th Corps has 2,200 supply just assigned to the 74th Corps. That's crazy. That's a lot of supply. A lot of disrupted units, too. Um, so we got these guys across the river. We took the base. We have 2,200 assault value garrisoned here. We have an additional 3,300 coming up behind. I could stop and fight. I think these are all tank units. Remember, they moved really quickly. We had like 900 assault vehicles. But we don't have any anti-tank guns pretty much in these units. Um, we've got a couple of field guns, 75 millimeters, a few 37 millimeter anti-tank guns actually. But I, I'm really hesitant to turn these guys around. They're all pretty much 40 plus miles in, which means they'll all be across the river next turn pretty much no matter what he does. So I'd rather just get them away rather than allow him to catch me. The one thing that makes me a little uneasy is there's 16,000 supplies in this hex. I'm assuming those supplies will move with my troops, and as I move, the supplies will move. But it would really be terrible if he captured 16,000 supplies from us. I don't think he will. I think the supply will follow our units. So when our last unit is out of the hex, then, uh, then, then we will be out of there as well. And then we'll be across the river, and I think it's highly unlikely he would shock attack across the river into bad terrain. If we take a look at the terrain modifier here, this is WR, which WR means it is 
forest and rough terrain, which gives a times three defensive value. So we get a times three defensive value. There's no fortifications here, unfortunately. We should probably build fortifications. But um, but yeah, so there's 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 that. I don't think he's going to rush across the river with just his tanks, which means we probably have a few turns. I also want to send a few units here to clear out the Raider Regiment here. So we really battered this unit up. We're moving this other infantry, un these other infantry units back. They're probably a day away, but I really want to just crush his, his Raider unit. I'm a little worried they'll retreat north toward Chungking because they will have an avenue to retreat. If we look at the roadway, there is a there is a roadway up this direction that they could retreat with no enemies there. But if we do hurt them, if we hurt them badly enough, then he may not be able to do that. Um, his troops just took Changtha, so they will not have begun any progress of marching west. They could get about 30 miles there next turn, uh, maybe 15, uh, but our troops already have like an 11 mile head start. So we should be able to get in there and crush his uh, his raider regiment before any of his uh, any of his troops catch me. Um, I do wonder, you know, I don't think it makes a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea to put all 5,000 of our assault value here at Tricky Kong. We probably need to split the formation a little bit because we can build forts here. We can't build forts in open terrain. So we, we probably want to, I mean, they're both rough and wooded, but I don't know. It probably makes sense to have a slightly larger force on this roadway because it's a direct roadway to Chungking. The one positive, though, is I don't think he would crush us here and leave a weak force behind because this base can attack him right in the flank and completely cut his supply line off. So we'll see. I'm curious to see what his approach is going to be. I also have some other reinforcements coming in from Chungking. So we've got the 52nd Chinese Corps coming down from the north. We have uh, a couple of units here, some artillery units and some anti-tank units here. 36 anti-tank guns. Those would be very useful against the Japanese if they cross the river. Quilin. So these guys are falling back here. 46 Chinese Corps. I'm just going to move them back this way. I want to get these guys destroyed so I can reform them at Chungking. They don't really have any equipment that we need to worry about. We get a third of their unit replaced for free. Next battleship, Sean. Um, let's take a look. Ship availability. We'll filter out everything except the battleships. Look at the ETA. June 10th of 42, we get the North Carolina. So we're a ways away from our next battleship. Um, by that point, we'll have two or three of the uh, Pearl Harbor battleships repaired. Uh, heavy cruisers... Looks like 11 days, and we'll get the Vincennes at Balboa. 17 days, and we'll get the Newcastle at Cape Town. 46 days, and we'll get the Devonshire at, at Cape Town. We'll start getting some anti-aircraft light cruisers here in a little bit over a month. Destroyers, meanwhile. Oh, my God, that's a lot of destroyers. Get a bunch of destroyers in four days at Balboa. What about tankers? Curious about that. Ooh, we get a bunch of taker, tankers at Abaddon in 10 days. That's going to be nice. Mine warfare? Five days we get in, uh, is this an auxiliary mine layer? Well, it's a tender. What's a YMS? It's like a... That's uh, just harbor patrol. It's a lot of tenders. I want some actual mine layers. Mine sweepers. When do I get mine layers? Cruiser mine layer in 62 days at Mare Island. There's got to be a way. Can you like convert ships to mine sweepers or to mine layers? Because it doesn't seem like we get a lot of them. Uh, what do you mean? Standards rebuild standard stats or are they pre-rebuild stats? I don't know what you mean by that. I mean, there are, you can, you can order shipping to do different types of rebuilds. So the Japanese player has basically complete control over his economy. The allied player has a little bit more restriction, but they don't need to really min-max their economy because they're going to get a bunch of stuff anyway. 
Um, but you can, yeah, I can choose to convert this guy to an auxiliary, an AG, transmarine tender, or transmarine cargo ship. So we can convert any of those to an AG. Depending on the type of ship you have, you can convert ships to different types of shipping. These guys upgrade. I think we had some stuff in. Uh, so like I could I could convert this um, auxiliary mine mine layer tender or whatever to a yard minesweeper or to a yard patrol. I don't know. Could have sworn we had some AKs that were were there. It might have just been at uh, over there. Sean, the battleships are standard as they were before Pearl, um, but they can get upgraded. So, for example, you can see here the West Virginia has not been upgraded yet. She's 113 days away from being ready, but there is a February 43 upgrade. So I think these are all... Actually, she's got radar, so she might have had, she might have had upgrade already done. No, first upgrade, one of three comes in 43 for her the west virginia the um maryland is a 243 and so is the the pennsylvania the arizona pennsylvania class has an upgrade in march so she's still pre pearl but then the upgrade that comes in march will add radar and and, and better anti-aircraft add those 20 millimeter orlicans Singapore was not bad, North. We destroyed... Well, it was bad for XTRG. We destroyed over 180 Japanese infantry squads, combat squads. And actually, if we take a look, I don't remember what the op, what the actual combat result was. Let's go back. Combat result. The one time I need the scroll pad to just go up. All right. So, Chengtha, they took. That's fine. So, here's Singapore. He lost 5,353 men, 181 enemy infantry squads destroyed with 296 disabled. Basically, that's a, a, a third of a division destroyed, the other two-thirds disabled. That's an entire infantry division brought out of the line for a period of time. 56 non-combatants disabled, 31 engineers destroyed, 81 disabled. That's another really big hit for his engineer force. He lost 50 guns and 12 vehicles. We lost just 12 squads destroyed compared to his 181. We lost 150 disabled compared to his 296. We did lose 25 non-combatants destroyed and 53 disabled. He had us there. Two engineers lost on our side, 28 disabled. 47 guns lost, uh, 44 of those disabled. 35 vehicles, 25 destroyed, 10 disabled. So the vehicles lost was bad. We did have one unit destroyed, but at the end of the day, he got way worse. He had a one to two assault range, and he didn't even reduce the fortifications, so the level is still at three. I don't think there's any way he can continue the attack for the next two or three, um, two or three days. Like a G-Man, I could rebuild the unit we lost. So if we take a look at ground units destroyed here, you can see, I think it was, does it give me the date? 227, it's the 3rd Cavalry Regiment of the 3rd Indian Corps. So, I don't know how much it would cost to rebuild. Not defined. Oh, 36, it would cost 36 political points to rebuild these guys. I mean, it's an armored unit, right? It could be useful. I'm not sure we even have the units in the in the pool to to fill it out. We would only get two units right away. The rest of these units would have to, so what we would get if we rebuilt would be one Merriman Harrington, which I don't know what that is, and one motorized support. The 40, 24, 24, 6 would all have to be pulled from the pool. I just don't think it's worth the 36 political points right now. You only build six Harringtons per month. Yeah. It's probably not worth it right now. Um, yesterday we lost C Company of the New Guinea Rifles. So a small formation there. It would cost two political points to reform them. 
Yeah. Uh, Valhanis, thanks for the follow. Appreciate it. What can be used to build forts? Fair number of engineer units destroyed that we could rebuild. I'd rather wait until the Dutch uh, East Indies fall, and then I think they'd get they'd get formed up in in Africa, and then we could transport them onto the base. I would love to rebuild the FMSV brigade. It's five hundred and forty political points to recall them. This I believe was the these guys were destroyed at where they destroyed at Hong Kong. I think it's a Malayan unit. They have one hundred and eight Malayan infantry squads. Eight Vickers, six Lewises, three-inch mortars and support. I don't know what we really pull in terms of Malayan squads, in terms of replacements. I'm guessing not very many, but that is pretty expensive for, for that unit to be able to reform. I don't know where they'd reform either. Probably India, which at some point could be useful, but we'll probably hold off on that now. The Middlesex Battalion, ABD. These guys are British. Vickers, motorized and support. Uh, what's no longer available on Steam? I don't think this ever was available on Steam. I could be wrong. Uh, the Zac, you can use nukes. So there is a strategic bombing mechanic that involves creating firestorms that destroys enemy manpower and industry. And again, Japan's industry is all on map, and he has to kind of micro all of his production of aircraft. Guys, he even has to produce aircraft engines. He has to produce aircraft engines. He has to produce aircraft fuselages. He has to match the number of engines to fuselages or he can't produce his aircraft. He's got to manage R&D. He's got to manage fuel supplies, or you know, fuel supplies, oil, uh, crude oil supplies. He's got to take resources back to the home islands to convert them to supply. Like it is a very complex industrial game for the Japanese player. Again, the allied player, most of that stuff's all simulated. But um, in theory, if you do strategic bombing, then you can you can basically destroy cities, and that has a big impact. Although typically by the time you're close enough to Japan to do that, I mean he's kind of already doomed anyway. Um, but there's a firestorm system. You can you can create firestorms potentially, which can white not. Affect, I mean you don't get rid of the hex, but you can like destroy. For example, you can see this base here. As we hover over it, you can see he's got those aircraft factories. The number in parentheses represents repair or building new factories, so basically not active yet. The number outside the parentheses represents the current number of, of production occurring. And you can push that entire number on the left over to the right if you do enough damage to a city. Additionally, you are able to use nuclear weapons later in the game, um, but if you use more than two of them, there's a really big political penalty, so it actually impacts your victory score at the end. Um, but yes, in theory, you can use nuclear weapons, and that impacts victory points up to a point. It's pretty crazy, guys. It's a pretty crazy game. Um, Scream and Cheese, thanks for the follow there. So I think that's probably going to do it for this turn. I know we don't really look at the Wen Cao Force. These guys are down to 212 AV. You can see their, um, their supplies are in trouble. 800 out of a necessary required 1,500. Wen Cao is going to fall in the next day or two, guys. Um, Mindanao, where we tried to get the Zeman in, is, is basically out of supply as well. 20 supplies here. But they did manage to resupply, so all these troops currently have more than the minimum number of supply. The 102nd is a little bit short in supply, but not much. It's uh, a little bit more than 10% short. So I think if he did attack us again right away, we would probably hold. Um, but then we would instantly fall after that due to lack of supply. That being said, that battle didn't show a supply penalty for us, so he may be a little bit hesitant to launch another attack right away and free up those troops. Um, he's got two divisions. Last we saw tying our divisions up in Bataan. Remember, we have 25,000 supply there. You've got almost 2,000 assault value up there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I don't know what the troops are north here. It says they're 12 north of Singapore, so he could be bringing massive reinforcements down, or they may just be support forces for all of his bombers. I'm not really sure. Um, but, yeah, that's the situation right now, guys. We've been going for about an hour and a half, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap this thing up. Hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, in our next episode, we'll be into March. So uh, it will be a new month, and we'll be one month closer to a lot of those Japanese perks and buffs sort of slowing up. Uh, he's only got about 90 days until June when things really start to even out from a 
uh, game system perspective. Although until we get that midway battle, we're, we're going to be at a pretty pretty decisive disadvantage. It'll be interesting to see if we get any skip bombing in on the carriers or if those planes just get wiped out by his cap. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what his carriers do next turn, how far, how fast they move. We could try and, you know, inter, inter, interject two sub patrols here across his front, but it's really hard to say whether we would actually intercept him. He'd probably be moving at a good good clip. Um, but yeah, that's that's the situation right now, guys. Uh, Port Moresby's hanging by a thread. I'm hoping he doesn't have the supply to launch another deliberate attack right away. Uh, this guy needs to use a patrol zone, so we're not going to do that. We're going to... We're going to set patrol zone. So we'll have this guy patrol these two hexes. I'm going to set as, mi as minimum uh, a width of patrol as possible and just hope that, uh, that, he, that he goes across that, that, that he doesn't divert too much and that our subs can get some torpedoes in on him. Although I'm not super, I'm not super optimistic. What about the captains of these crews? The uh, the Grayback captain is Lieutenant Commander Saunders, level 64 leadership, 57 uh, inspiration, only 49 aggression. That's not very, that's not very aggressive. What about the Argonaut? Who's the commander of the Argonaut? It is Commander Vincent H. Aggression of 56, better aggression, so he might have a chance to to launch an attack there. Um, these guys are currently packing full loads of torpedoes, and both the subs are in relatively good shape, so who knows? Maybe we'll get a lucky shot out in the open sea. But again, with that being said, guys, I do appreciate you tuning in. We had a pretty good show in here tonight. Uh, to all the new followers, thanks for showing up. To the subs, thanks for the continued support. It is appreciated. And uh, until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you for watching, and until next time, I'm out.